So here we need to change our view a little bit. We're going to switch from talking about demand, the consumer, that's how you and I typically identify as the purchaser of goods and services. We need to switch our view instead to focus on the seller, the producer, the supplier of these goods and services. And the reality of the situation, right, is that in reality, we are at any time, we are both suppliers and demanders, right? We do enter both of these in our day-to-day -day world. Um, we typically identify, we typically notice the demand side more because that's predominantly where we find ourselves. But for example, you are a supplier of your labor. Right? You have a job, you supply your labor to your employer, your employer is the demander in that case there. And so we can think about supply from that perspective as well, and we can say, okay, yeah, we are suppliers at the same time. What are we going to take a look at in this video? Well, so not quite as much to look at in supply as we had to look into with demand. Uh, what we're going to take a look at to start off is we're going to explain the different interpretations of supply. So we did this with our demand curve, right? With our demand, we had marginal benefit, maximum willingness to pay. Well, here on the supply side, very similarly, we're going to take a look at the marginal cost, the minimum willingness to accept. Again, our alternative interpretations. We'll list our determinants of supply. We'll make the supply curve dance around just like we did the demand curve. This is probably one of the most important parts of this video is our determinants of supply and what causes it to move. And then we'll finish off taking a look at measures of sensitivity. So again, the marginal effect and elasticity. Much less to look at though with our elasticity of supply. It'll be more of just a brief overview of the topic. So let's jump in and let's take a look at our supply curve and let's start off with our interpretations of it. So in taking a look at supply, one of the first things to again make sure that we're clear on is that all of our analysis being done is being done uh ceteris paribus ceteris paribus which again well, that was a bad e uh ceteris paribus which again what is that meaning this is meaning that we're holding everything else in the world constant except for that one thing we're evaluating right we took a look at this with our demand we said okay if we had a change in the price of another good well that was a change in the price of another good assuming own price was constant, incomes were constant, population was constant, tastes and preferences were constant. All of that stuff was not changing. The only thing in the world that changed was the price of the other good. Same idea here. Cetris Paribus is the like fundamental way we perform analysis. Everything in the world is held constant except for that one thing we are evaluating. So first big, first big tool that we have, the Cetris Paribus analysis. Next, what we want to do is we want to look at our big assumption, and we already listed this big assumption in the last one, but really bring it out again. And this big assumption is that we're going to have lots of homogenous, right? And again, big $5 word, homogenous, what that means is just they're all the same. Lots of homogenous consumers and producers. So that is our supply curve is being represented for lots of identical producers. That is, if we go back to what we're thinking about, this is really our perfect competition. Perfectly competitive, right? So firms in a perfectly competitive market, we saw how we obtained that supply curve by aggregating up all of their individual supply curves. And that is our big fundamental assumption going on here is that we have these perfectly competitive firms. So, okay, to carry on then, let's kind of go through the same kind of fashion as we did with our demand curve. And that is, let's differentiate between these two terms, supply and quantity supplied. So we have price, we have quantity, and let's get a supply curve in here. There we go. Supply. And so first thing, the curve itself is the supply. What this curve is representing is all of the different price to quantity, right? So again, that is, uh, let's change colors. Let's use yellow. Some price yielding some quantity, price yielding a quantity supplied. And right, this 
All this curve is doing is just relaying this information. We have some other price relaying some other quantity supplied. So again, price to quantity supplied is our definition of the supply curve. That is, again, if you want to think about it in terms of exogenous, endogenous variables, in thinking about the supply curve, price is our exogenous variable. Quantity supplied is the one that's explained by the system. So quantity supplied would be the endogenous variable. That is, if you want to think about it, that would be, we'd have our functional form as quantity supplied equals some slope times the price plus the vertical intercept. Right, again, this is just y equals mx plus b. Except, right, y equals mx plus b, except typically we're like, hey, this is y, this is x. Uh ho. Y, q, uh -huh. Right, again, just like with our demand curve, when we have this representation, our axes are flipped, right? We have this happening, and as a result, we don't typically mathematically, in introductory courses at least, we don't typically look at this expression of our supply. We will typically evaluate the inverse supply curve. That is, we'll typically evaluate price equals M quantity supplied plus B. That is, Y is price, X is Q. And this interpretation, well, this is our marginal cost or minimum willingness to accept interpretation. So, okay, this guy here, this is our supply interpretation. So, again, first kind of takeaway, price giving us some quantity supplied. The supply curve is all the possible combinations of price and quantity supplied being relayed to us. So, it seems like a minute uh, differentiation, but an important one just the same. So, first bit there. What about on this side here? Price going the other way. Price is a function of quantity supplied, right? In this case here, quantity supplied is our exogenous variable, the one we witness in the wild. We witness this quantity, put it into the functional form, and we get our endogenous price, or I guess marginal cost, minimum willingness to accept, right? Ultimately, dollars per unit is how we measure price. So marginal cost, dollars per unit. Minimum willingness to accept the lowest price that I'd be willing to accept per unit. So price works in this sense here. Okay. In that sense there, well, the only distinction, the only difference. Let's just get rid of these, uh, get rid of these arrows. So only distinction in this case here, we would have our, let's say marginal cost to start. And in our marginal cost case, we would say, okay, for this quantity here, I would have quantity to price. So at this quantity, I would have a extra cost to produce this last unit of whatever my value is of marginal cost. For this quantity, quantity up to price, I would have this value as my extra cost for my extra unit produced, right? And this is the extra cost of that last unit. So quantity to price yielding the marginal cost. Very similarly, right, we could just back up and redo that. We could say instead, uh, we could say instead some quantity supplied, well, in order for me as a producer to be willing to sell this amount of stuff, I need to obtain at least this price. This is the lowest price that I would accept to make and sell this many goods. So this price here would be my minimum willingness to accept. Right? Just like with demand, we had a maximum willingness to pay. If I could get it for cheaper, I'd want to get it for cheaper. In the case of our supplier here, this is our minimum price that we would accept. But if I could sell it for more, I'd, I'd sell it for more. Right? That kind of idea going on. Same idea here as we go on, right? So now we have a minimum willingness to accept curve at this quantity. So to ramp up production, ramping up production is also ramping up my costs. Hey, we saw that marginal cost went up. 
So as I ramp up production, I'm ramping up my costs to produce up this quantity here, quantity, I would have this new higher minimum willingness to accept minimum price per unit in order to be enticed to produce this many units. So our three different interpretations going on here. In the same way, right, with our demand, we went right into the math with it. We could do that very, very similarly here. Let's suppose that we have a supply equation being given as, uh, let's say, price equals 10 plus 2Q, right? And so if we wanted to actually visualize this, we could, oh, let's make the axes white as we've been typically doing. There we go. So we have price, we have quantity, and then same kind of interpretation, right? Price equals 10 plus 2Q. This is my vertical intercept. This guy here is my slope, same as it was with our demand curve. The only difference is we have a positive slope instead of a negative slope. That means we are upward sloping. So upward sloping with a vertical intercept of 10. Let's say, I don't know, maybe right there is 10. And then going up from there with a slope of 2. There's my supply, my marginal cost, or my minimum willingness to accept, depending on which interpretation I'm looking for. And that guy there, that guy there was 10. The value, my minimum willingness to accept if I had a price of 0. Okay, so... What kind of questions could we ask about this? Well, okay, I could say, suppose our quantity supplied is, um, suppose our quantity supplied is 25 units. What was the extra cost of the last unit produced right so what was the extra cost for the extra unit produced extra for an extra what is that getting at that is getting at what is my marginal cost so okay marginal cost what are we doing we are saying for some quantity of 25 some quantity of 25 what is the value of my marginal cost? Well, to solve this, quite simply, we just have to go back to our form, here, our formula here, our functional form. So what do we have? We have price equals 10 plus 2 quantity. So price equals 10 plus 2 times 25, right? That's my quantity that I'm just plopping in for Q. Everything's known. All I gotta do is add or multiply together. Uh, Appropriately, so 2 times 25, that gives me 50 plus 10 equals price. What do I get then? Price equals 60. So, okay, in that sense there, my marginal cost, the extra cost that I faced for producing an extra unit was $60. That was the extra cost of production for that final unit as I jumped from 24 to 25 units of production, for example. So we can work that out, right? I could very similarly, uh, let's make some room here. Okay, we could very similarly say instead, let's just fix that, 60. Uh, what is the firm's minimum willingness to accept to produce, uh, let's say, 15 units. That is, in order to entice this firm to produce 15 units, what's the minimum price that must be offered in this market? So, okay, same kind of idea. Let's just visualize where this would be. If this is 25, 15 is, I don't know, maybe something like this. Up to my curve, we're going minimum willingness to accept, so quantity to price, and I'm saying that's 15. So how do I get my result? Again, just pull out our functional form. 
Price is 10 plus 2 times 15. Okay, 2 times 15 is 30. 30 plus 10 is 40. There we go. Price equals 40. Or the lowest price that would have to be in this market in order to entice me to produce 15 units would be $40 a unit. So another interpretation. Marginal cost, minimum willingness to accept, same process we go through to calculate, right? And keep in mind, that's really why it's our minimum willingness to accept. That was the extra cost that I had to incur to produce it. And so because that's my extra cost, well, that's my minimum price that I would then sell it for. Because I say, that's the cost of doing it. Anything above that, great, I make extra money. But anything below that, I'm losing money, so I'm, I'm not going to be too happy to produce at that level. So, are two different interpretations. What about, what about on the other side? Suppose instead we were saying, oh, let's switch colors again. Let's suppose instead we were saying, at a price of 50, right, so at a price of 50, what is the quantity supplied to the market? And okay, so what's our functional form? Price equals 10 plus 2 quantity supplied. Well, in this case, I know price. I know that guy. So let's plop that in. 50 equals 10 plus 2 quantity supplied. One unknown requires a little bit of algebra to work through, but, but we can do that. We can do that. Let's, uh, let's start off by getting rid of this 10. So subtract 10 from both sides, we'll get 40 equals 2 quantity supplied. Okay, get the quantity supplied by itself, isolate that one, so divide both sides by 2, and we get 20 equals our quantity supplied. Okay, big thing, right? We have some numbers popping on here. We can kind of make sure that this makes sense, kind of check our math. In this case here, what do we have? We had a price of 50, so kind of right in the middle between those two. And, right, so okay, supply is going price to quantity, so price down to quantity. What did I have? I had 50 yielding 20. And yeah, right, that makes sense. 20 is bigger than 15, less than 25. Those of you guys work out too. We didn't make any math mistakes. If we went, right, Kind of way to check your work. If we went through and you were like, yeah, I'm pretty confident of that answer, pretty confident of that answer, but for this answer, we calculated 30. Well, that should be a pretty big red flag, right? That should be a pretty big red flag that that's a no go because 30 is bigger than 25, but yet we're finding it to the left of 25. So, red flag, stop. We've made a mistake. Back up, try again. So, that's kind of just a way that we can check our work with the graph by making sure things kind of all, all line up. Okay, so our different interpretations of supply. We've worked through that. Supply, marginal cost, minimum willingness to accept. Part of this, what we've kind of glossed over is, and again, don't overly like this terminology, is this whole law of supply. Right, and I don't overly love this terminology because of this whole bit here that it's a law. I had this conversation, maybe rant, last video about this, how eh, very few things in economics I would actually agree with being laws. They're more, this is a pretty strong theory of supply. But just the same, law of supply, what it's getting at is that price and our quantity supplied are positively related. That is, if price goes up, well, I'm going to be enticed to produce more, right? At a higher price, I get more price for every, a higher price for every uh, cookie I sell. I'm going to want to make more cookies. If the price of cookies falls though, well, if price of cookies is falling, I'm not making as much money from cookies, so I'm not going to be enticed to produce as much. So price and quantity are positively related for supply. They'll move in the same direction. So our law of supply. Okay, a little bit out of order when we were going through demand, right? I wanted to kind of keep things along the same lines, but I feel like this would fit in better here. 
before we go through and start jumping through our determinants of supply and the sensitivity of supply, let's take a look at this whole idea of our marginal cost. And let's just go jump to a new page and take a look at that. So let's draw our supply curve. We have our axes, we have price, we have quantity, and we'll keep with uh, what we started off with using blue for our supply. There we go, we have our supply curve, and we could even say that this is the same one we've been working with, if, if we wanted to, right? We could say that this is price equals 10 minus two quantity supply. And in this case, let's, let's give it the interpretation of our marginal cost, right? The extra cost of producing an extra unit. And so what we can go through is we can kind of create a little table here and we can say, hey, at our quantity, what is our corresponding marginal cost? And at a quantity of one, well, okay, let's, let's work through that. Quantity of one, where do we find ourselves? Maybe something like that. Quantity over to price. So at a quantity of one, two times one is two. Oh, I don't have a minus, I have a plus here. So two times one is two, two plus 10 is 12. So I had a marginal cost of 12. There was the extra cost that I incurred from going from zero to one unit. So that first unit cost me an extra $12. We carry on, right? We go two units. So as I jump up to two, my extra cost jumps up as well. So two times two is four, four plus 10 is 14. So 14, there we go. And we could keep kind of going in this fashion. Big thing that we're getting at in this is that what we can do is we could also similarly work out our total cost. And I wanna put just a little asterisk beside that because it's, well, marginal cost is the change in total cost for a change in output. We looked through back in producer theory that what this actually simplified down to was truthfully a change in total variable cost for a change in output. Meaning when we go through this, we're not actually calculating our total cost, we're actually calculating our total variable cost, just kind of our labor cost of production. We're ignoring our fixed costs when we do this. So if this was in the long run, eh, that'd be fine because everything would be variable. Everything would just be the total cost. But if we're in the short run, technically we're just doing a variable cost. But kind of a little bit of a bit that we could ignore for our 103 kind of point here. So, okay, what's my total cost? Well, as I produced one unit, I faced an extra cost of 12. So my total cost was 12. As I produced another unit, so plus one, I got plus 14 in costs, right? I face an extra $14 worth of costs to produce that extra unit. So what is that gonna give me? We're gonna have 26, right? And I can keep going on in this fashion there. And what we'll notice is kind of similar as to what we had before. This is just our area here of each box, right? So 12, this guy here, 14, right? And I'm just kind of aggregating up what this area is underneath the box as I go up underneath my marginal cost curve and I can work out my total cost in that kind of fashion. In the same kind of way then, what we can do is I, we kind of invoke that assumption of infinitesimally divisible output. That is somehow I could produce 0.2 or 1.689 units, right? Have this infinitesimally divisible possibility of production. If that was the case, I don't need to do these discrete boxes. I can instead just go and take, oh, that's not the one I wanted. I can instead just go and take some quantity, figure out what the corresponding point is over there. And let's say, I don't know, let's say that this is something like, 30 units being produced. So at 30 units, I wanna know, hey, what is my total cost of production? What is the cost that we face for producing this? And keep in mind, right? When we're talking about costs in this sense, in this economic sense, economic costs, 
These are both our accounting costs as well as our opportunity costs. And as this is the market supply, right, the total amount being supplied to this market, well, this is going to be kind of our social cost of production. The fact that we're producing hot dogs instead of sausages, or the fact that we're producing apples instead of peaches, right? There's going to be a cost associated with that. The fact that we've used this land, this labor for this resource rather than another. So it's a social cost altogether that we're able to calculate in this sense. And all I can do in that case then is I can just go and take the summation, or rather not the summation, I can calculate the area here underneath my supply curve or underneath my marginal cost curve with the way that I currently have it. And this entire area here is going to yield that cost of production. So how do we solve for that? Well, just like we had seen before, we can break anything underneath a curve into different geometric shapes. So we notice, boom, cutting that line across. We now have this. We now have this rectangle down here and then the triangle up top. So we just need to calculate each of these individually, add the two together, and we'll get our total cost. Can be inverse as to what we're doing with demand, right? Where we're calculating the total benefit. So total benefit on the demand side, total cost on the supply side. So okay, let's work through that. First thing, let's work out this triangle. So for that triangle there, what we need to do is area of a triangle, one half, base, times height. What's our base? Base of this triangle is 30. So we'd have one half, 30. What's the height of my triangle? Oh, we need to figure out this value. We need to figure out what is my marginal cost for this 30th unit produced. Well, how do we do that? We go back to our functional form. And we have that price equals 10 plus 2 times 30. So, okay, work that out. 2 times 30, that's 60. All right, that guy there, that gives me 60. 60 plus 10, that gives me a price or a marginal cost of 70. So, okay, I have my height. What's my height here? 70? Don't fall for that trap. I see that a lot. I see that a lot. Our height's not 70, right? Our height is starting at 10 and then going up to 70. So our height here is 60. So careful for that. I see that happening a lot as a trap in figuring out our height. You go, okay, that's our value. 70 is the one that we have there. No, 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 it's not. So what does that work out? One half, 30 times 60. That's going to give me 900 as my total area in there. The other bit, okay, my rectangle, that's just base times height. Well, my base, I've already calculated that, 30. And the height of this rectangle is there, that's 10. So 10, 30 times 10, that's gonna give me 300. Taking my two, all I have to do is add them together now to find my total cost. So 900 plus 300, take the summation of that. 900 plus 300 gives me 1,200 being my total social cost of producing uh, whatever generic good we're producing in this case. $1,200 is my social cost of producing widgets, right? Sure, why not? Hot dogs, sausages, bananas, apples, whatever this good might be. $1,200, that is our social cost of producing 30 units. So we can calculate this. Once we bring this together, we have both supply and demand. This starts to get a little bit more interesting because we can calculate all together, hey, what's our total social benefit gained from the demand side, right? What's our benefit that we've received versus what's the total social cost of producing? And then from that, we can compare benefits to costs and determine are we winners or are we losers by our production choices. And we'll take a look at that in follow-up videos in the coming weeks. So. Total cost. That being said, 
Great, little bit out of order from how we went through it with demand. Let's go on now and take a look at our determinants of supply. And again, just like we had for our demand curve, we're going to have six of these guys. Six determinants of supply all together. And let's take a look at them. Let's get our graph drawn and go from there. So we get our axes first, always labeling our axes, price, quantity, and let's get a generic supply curve. We won't do this with the math. We'll just say, there's my supply, alternatively marginal cost, alternatively minimum willingness to accept. But the way all these determinants are listed is they're the determinants of supply. So they're all listed in the way in which it impacts the supply curve. Keep in mind, they're all synonyms. So the change in one is going to influence them all just the same. So first one there, change in price of own good. Right, so if we're producing hot dogs, as we looked at with our demand. Well, if we had a change in the price of hot dogs, it's going to change our, that will cause a change in our quantity supplied, right? And that is because as we've seen, as we've seen price equals MQ plus B, price shows up, Q shows up. So, hey, change in price is a change in Q. So all we've done, if we have a change in price, we used to have this read off from our supply curve. Price went up at a higher price, law of supply, higher price, higher quantity supplied. So no movement of the line, a change in price of own good is just a change in the quantity supplied. Okay, so first one, movement along the line. What do we have for our next one then? Let's take a look at that. Next guy is a change in the price of inputs. So change in the price of inputs, change in the price of the things that we need in order to produce our final product, good or service. So say we are looking at the production of books. Okay, we're looking at the chain in the production of books and all of a sudden, the price of paper goes up, right? So price of paper, paper is an input into our book production. So if the price of paper goes up, ceteris paribus, price of own goods the same. So that is, we had fixed price. There's my fixed price, P naught. I used to be producing right there. We'll call that Q naught. All of a sudden, the price of paper and input into my production process has gone up. Well, would I be wanting to produce more books for that same price or fewer books for that same price? Well, hopefully you realize, right, business in business to maximize profit. If an input cost goes up and the price that they sell their books for is exactly the same, well, they're not going to be able to produce as much as they used to. So our quantity supplied would fall and we would have our quantity supply falling down to Q1. Okay, but again, this isn't on our line, right? This is off of our supply curve. So what has happened? Well, for that being off our supply curve, that means that our supply curve has shifted to the left. Right, and again, just like we talked about with demand, we're always going to be presuming a parallel shift, just a change in the intercept, essentially. Slope, slope will stay the same. It is just a change in the intercept, right? That would have been B naught, this would have been B1 with respect to that B there. So parallel shifts is just going to be our simplifying assumption as we work through this. So. Change in price of inputs. Of course, right, we can look at the other case. Maybe all of a sudden our price of labor, right, our workers that we use, maybe something's happened and wages have fallen. 
So now we get to pay our workers less. Price of labor has gone down. Well, if price of labor has gone down, my inputs into production have dropped for the same price. I am now able to produce more than I used to. And so my supply curve would increase. It would shift to the right. So I could have that situation happen as well. Let's take a look at our next one. Okay, so starting off again, back with our just typical supply curve with some fixed price and our quantity supplied. Our next one that we would take a look at is change in the price of other goods. Okay, so change in the price of another good. And that is just like when we were taking a look at our demand curve, we are going to have both complements and substitutes. Or keep in mind, this is not complements and substitutes of consumption. This is our complements and substitutes of production. So either the trade-offs that we could consider or things that get produced together. So to start off, it's easier to think about our substitutes. So let's think about our substitutes of production. First, let's think about, oh, maybe this is the market or the supply of trucks, right? And any of our manufacturing plants for vehicles, let's presume that they could be easily fitted to produce either trucks or cars. Okay, keep in mind, maybe this is Ford Canada or something like that. Right now, Ford has this price of trucks and they're producing this quantity of trucks. They also have some price of cars and they're producing some amount of cars as well. Let's presume that such as Paribus, everything else constant, everything else constant, the price of our cars goes up. If price of cars goes up, well, law of supply, Ford was going to be enticed to produce more cars. Their quantity supplied of cars is going to rise. So price of cars up, quantity supplied of cars up. What we're interested in is how does this impact our market for trucks, right? Keep in mind, Ford's gonna face a production possibility frontier. Let's just quickly look at this. They're gonna have a production possibility frontier. Downward sloping, we would have trucks, we would have cars, and perhaps we find ourselves something like this to start off. Right, we have some Q naught truck and we have some Q naught car. As the price of cars goes up, our quantity supplied of cars goes up. So, okay, we increase our car production. Boom. But as we increase our car production, what's happened? Our truck production falls because we have trade offs, right? We have trade offs. In order to produce more cars, I have to give up some trucks. So, quantity of trucks down. All this has happened for a price of trucks that's fixed. No change in my price of trucks. Cetris Paribus, going back to our determinants, if I have a change in this determinant price of another good, this determinant here is fixed, constant, not changing. So, that's what we have there. So, okay, how does this relate back up to our graph? What do we say? Quantity of trucks has fallen. So we used to have Q0. We're now going to have Q1. Quantity's fallen. We now find ourselves there. Hey, again, that's not on our supply curve. What does that mean? Well, again, that means that our supply curve has shifted to the left. So Supply shifted to the left due to an increase in the price of a substitute. What about the other case? Well, our other case that we can consider is going to be the impact of a complement. And complements are, I find, traditionally pretty, a little bit more difficult for many students to wrap their heads around for our production side. And so let's take a look at a example of a complement. Let me just make some room here so that we can do so, talking and trying to work on that at the same time. Okay, so for complement, complements are situations where you produce one thing and by producing it, you just by default get the other as well. 
So what, what would be an example of a situation like that? Let's take a look at the production of oil. Typically speaking, when we go and we produce oil, well, as we drill for oil, as we extract the raw crude oil, in many places we also obtain natural gas. Right, it's right there in the process. It's typically in the same kind of reserves. And so as we get more oil, we typically also get more natural gas. They go in tandem. Another example of this would be the production of, uh, let's say the production of lumber and wood chips. Right, so as we produce our lumber, as we produce our boards that we need, the two by fours, two by sixes, our plywood, all of this. There's a whole bunch of leftover wood chips and these wood chips are then used for, well, all the things we use wood chips for. Sawdust, same kind of idea, right? So there's many, there's not a ton, but there's many goods that are complements of production. As we grow apples, we have certain apples that aren't great to be consumed as apples and those leftovers are used for apple juice. As we produce more apples, we'll also produce more apple juice by default. So these here, they go in conjunction with each other. They go hand in hand. So maybe let's take a look at that last one first. Let's take a look at apple juice. So we are looking at the supply curve for apple juice. And let's presume that all of a sudden the price of apples rises. Well, okay, given our law of supply, price of apples up means that quantity supplied of apples up. If I'm producing more apples, well, complements of production, they go hand in hand. So as I'm producing more apples, I will also be producing more apple juice. So in that case there, price of apple juice is constant, Cetris Paribus, right? This guy's fixed. The only thing changing is my price of apples. I'm analyzing this shock. And as this change has happened over in that, it's caused that guy to change. So, okay, what has that guy done? It's gone up. So I now have more apples being, apple juice, sorry, being produced at that point. And again, I'm not on my supply curve. Not being on my supply curve means that my supply curve has shifted to the left, or to the right, sorry. Supply curve has increased, it has shifted to the right. So, okay, we had our complements, we had our change in the price of other goods, and we see how that guy there works through. Of course, we could work through this as a symmetric effect. If instead the price of apples had fallen, well, we would have produced less apples, and if we're producing less apples, we would be also having less apple juice. So, goes in both ways there. Okay, our next determinant of demand, we have change in own price, change in the price of inputs, change in the price of other goods. We're also going to have our next guy here. Uh, we'll call this guy technology. Technology. And so technology, changes in technology, sometimes you'll see this as technology slash weather. Changes in technology and weather really are just going to be exogenous events that occur that make our production either more effective or less effective. Right? So, and typically right, a lot of times we don't really have this idea as to what the technology is going to do. We don't have an idea as to what the weather is going to be before it all of a sudden happens. It's why all of a sudden orchards get decimated by hailstorms. We know, okay, hail might be coming, but we don't necessarily know how bad it is or nor can we do anything about it until it's already happening. And in that case there, just boom, some event has changed our ability to produce. So let's take a look. We can take a look at an example from a few years ago. We can talk about oil production and right here in Canada, most of our oil production happens in our oil fields up in the north of Alberta. Well, a few years ago, quite a few years ago now, we had a large forest fire rip through that area. Because of the forest fire, we had to shut down production. So the forest fire caused Cetris Paribus, our quantity of oil being produced, to fall. Right? This 
Forest fire caused a shutdown of production. Shutdown of production has caused quantity to fall. Let's see if I can get that as a straight line. Quantity to fall. As quantity fell, well, that caused our supply of oil to shift to the left. There we go. Shift to the left. So negative kind of effect there. If you look at the same kind of idea, right now we have COVID going on. COVID's causing massive supply problems. And the big thing is because we're having all of these labor not being there, right? All of a sudden we have this exogenous event, would kind of classify this underneath this weather kind of bit, as awkward as that is. And all of a sudden, because of this difficulty in producing, this exogenous event making production difficult or has halted production altogether, our supply has decreased, our supply has shifted to the left. So an example of that. Technology, well, technology is going to be things that all of a sudden, all else equal, increase our ability to produce. So that could be something like all of a sudden computers made accounting so much more productive, right? Rather than filling out all of these tax forms, all of that by hand, having a personal computer, having things pre-populated or being able to be carried forward throughout greatly increased our ability of the amount of tax returns we could file and thus greatly increased our supply curve. Automation, same kind of idea. Through automation, through the machines coming in, all of a sudden we've been able to produce vehicles at a much more rapid rate than ever before, causing our supply curve to shift to the right. So typically speaking, a lot of times technology can work in our favor, pushing supply to the right. Weather or these kind of other exogenous events, they can go either way. Sometimes we can have really favorable weather, really good growing season that gets a super return on crops. Or we can have really bad weather, really bad other exogenous events that completely destroys, shuts down our supply. So it can go both ways for that there. Our next one to take a look at is our, and this is kind of in line to what we we're talking about in how we got our supply curve, would be number of suppliers. And this is very similar to when we we're talking about population with demand. If we go back to how we created this supply curve in our end of producer theory videos, we said, hey, all this supply curve was, was the marginal cost above the average variable cost of each firm aggregated horizontally. So, right, to refresh ourselves, let's just go take a look at that. We had a firm, we have another firm, and then all together we have our market. In each firm, we have, uh, let's fully label all these, price, 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 quantity, quantity, quantity. Okay, for each firm, we have our average variable cost. And trying to make these identical, that's not at all identical. There we go. Average variable cost. Pretty close, right? Lots of homogeneous firms, so same cost structure for each one. We then had our marginal cost. Marginal cost coming up through the minimum of our average variable cost. That guy's a little bit off, but we're doing our best. And then we could just so go, okay, we have some price. And at this price, we have from our marginal cost, our Q star, price equals marginal cost, marginal revenue equals marginal cost, gave us our optimal level of output. And so we'd have a Q star, and maybe that's five. That's five. So altogether in the market, we had five from this firm, five from that firm, we had 10. Right, very similarly, if we had all together, a thousand firms that were being represented like this. Well, okay, here we're just showing two of them, but if we had a thousand all being shown, well, we could go, okay, five from this guy, five from that guy, five, five, on and on and on and on and on, and five times a thousand, and we would have, let me just get, let's get that guy there, right? All together, we would have had 5,000 as our quantity supplied. So we just see by that, hey, when we had two firms, we had a quantity supplied of 10. When we have a thousand firms, we have a quantity supplied of 5,000, all for the same price. That is, right, as we went through that, this would have been our supply curve going through that. 
supply curve would have been shifting to the left when we had fewer firms and shifting to the right as we had more firms. So how that guy there would work through. Number of suppliers. Our final one then, our final one is our expectations. Very similar to like what we were talking about with our demand curve, we have expectations. So what do we expect to happen in the future? Do we expect all of a sudden prices to rise? Well, if we expect prices to rise, we might want to rejig our production in order to take advantage of that. If we would expect changes in the number of sellers, well, we would rejig based off of that. Right? So based off of our expectations of the future, we are going to change our production now today. So another example, maybe we expect that electric vehicles will dominate in the future, right? Electric vehicle sales will rise. So even though maybe trucks are selling well today, given that this belief that electric vehicles are going to be really selling, that trucks won't be selling in the near term, well, firms might proactively change their production mix. They might start to decrease their truck production and increase their EV production even though there's no clear signal today that that's happening, but it's their expectation. So we would have that. I would want to throw in as well, I want to throw in a seventh determinant. It's not truthfully a determinant. It does not cause our supply curve to shift. Rather, this would be causing our supply curve to be augmented. That is, our supply curve would still be there, but it would have an augmentation on it one way or another. And that would be through the presence of taxes or subsidies. And, whoa, that was fun. Uh, subsidies, there we go. So the way that we would look at this, and we're not really going to get into the details of this for a little bit yet, but the way that this would work is if we had a tax being put on this market, well, our supply, our cost of production, or the minimum price that we would be willing to accept to produce, this is all staying the same. This curve is not affected. But from the way that we witness it, it would be as if, let's use the actual line tool, it would be as if my supply curve was augmented. This would be my supply plus a tax. So... Taxes would shift my supply, not shift my supply, sorry, but augment my supply to the left. And if I had a subsidy put into place, well, a subsidy would cause my supply curve to be augmented down to the right. So supply plus a subsidy. So we would have that impact happening there. And taxes would shift it to the left, subsidy to the right. Sorry, I said shift it again. The supply curve would still stay there. We would just also have this plus tax or plus subsidy line correspondingly. So we would have that case there. Okay, before we go in and take a look at our marginal effects or our elasticities of supply, let's take a look at a few quick examples as to, well, how these guys shift around. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so here we have a few examples. Uh, to start off, let's look at the first guy there. With respect to the supply of apples, the price of cherries suddenly increases. Apples and cherries are substitutes of production. Okay, so what exactly is happening here? Uh, we need to work through what the impact is on our supply of apples, right? With respect to the supply of apples, that's what we're interested in. So we need to figure out what's happening to our supply curve. Again, as we go through these, I'd recommend you pause them. You try to figure out which way the supply curve goes first yourself, and then take a look compare it to what I'm saying is happening and see if you agree or get the same result really. So let's take a look. First thing, let's draw our diagram. So we have our axes, we have our price, we have our quantity, and we'll have just a generic supply curve as such. Okay, this generic supply curve, we will have some price point and at that price point, we have our quantity supplied. So we'll go Q0, P0, and we have our initial setup. Okay, now, right, we can even be a little bit more specific if we wanted to. We can say, hey, we're talking about apples. 
Okay, so with respect to the price of apples, the price of cherries suddenly goes up. So, okay, price of cherries goes up. What does this mean? Well, okay, we're saying that apples and cherries are substitutes of production. That is, we could produce either apples or cherries. So, if the price of cherries goes up, what do we want to do? Well, law of supply, price of cherries up, quantity supplied of cherries goes up. Hey, then you have trade-offs. If we're producing more cherries, that's less apples. So quantity supplied of apples would be down. That is, all of a sudden we find ourselves right there. And Q1, we have fallen for a fixed price level, right? This has all happened, Cetris Paribus. So in that case there, what has happened to our supply curve? Our supply curve has shifted to the left. Uh, it's not quite far enough. There we go. Our supply curve has shifted to the left. There it is. So we have our result for that guy. So with respect to some generic market, the introduction of 5G networks has drastically increased telecommunication, allowing for remote work opportunities never before witnessed, causing a surge in productivity. So if you haven't looked into this, there's actually massive potential productivity enhancements that could be happening with the speed of 5G networks. Uh, the latency is so low that essentially you could have a surgeon on the East Coast performing a surgery via robotic connection, robotic upload on the West Coast, and everything would be able to happen so fluidly, so fast, that you would no longer have these hubs where surgeons are located and can only do surgeries there. Right? That's just one example of some of the productivity gains we could witness. But if you start looking into it, there's many, many that are being kind of thought where it's like, wow, this could be revolutionary for us with how much faster 5G networks potentially can be. So, okay. That being said, really, what are we getting out of this? Allowing for remote work opportunities never before witnessed, causing a surge in productivity. Okay. So really, it's that last bit there that is giving us our bit of information surge in productivity that is for the same price cetris paribus same price all of a sudden i am finding that i am more productive if i'm more productive i'm able to produce more stuff so my quantity has increased q1 find myself out there now if i'm out there now my supply curve has shifted to the right so whatever shift of my supply curve in that case there. Okay, what about the next one? With respect to the supply of coffee, a large tropical storm hits decimating coffee bean crops. Okay, so here we'll have our supply of coffee. We have our current price and the current quantity being produced. Without any change in the price of coffee, all of a sudden we've had a tropical storm hit. Coffee crops are decimated. That is, all of a sudden, just because of this tropical storm, we are not able to produce as much as we once were. A whole bunch of our crops have just been destroyed. So the amount we're able to produce has fallen. As that's happened, we're now this price quantity combination, not on the existing line. That means that our line has shifted to the left. So we would have our new supply curve. Okay. So that's our three examples to look at the impacts of shifting supply. This again, just like our determinants of demand, is a big aspect, especially as we move on into future chapters. So really make sure you're taking a look at this. Really make sure you're comfortable in moving these curves around, when it causes a curve, which direction it causes it to move, et cetera, et cetera. The other big thing ultimately as well is that you'll have statements like these, and you'll have to discern from the statement, is this a demand shock or is this a supply shock, right? It won't necessarily specifically say what happens to the supply, what happens to the demand. There will be other keywords, right? There will be other keywords that will say, um, so instead of supply of apples, it might say with respect to the production of apples, um, apples and cherries are substitutes of Production. So, okay, production is talking about supply side. Um, surge in productivity, again, that's a supply side kind of word. So, you'll see different kinds of keywords popping up that are kind of hinting that we're talking about something to do with production versus something to do with consumption. Production is supply, consumption is demand. So, 
you'll have to keep that in mind as you go through as well. To finish off this video, we're going to take a look at our last little bit, which is taking a look at sensitivity. So for some change in the price, how does my quantity supply change? Am I going to rapidly increase my production as the price rises? Or does the price rise and I barely change my production? What, what exactly influences this? How sensitive am I to this change in price as a producer? So we'll take a look at that next. Okay, again, from the sensitivity side, we have two different ways that we can look at sensitivity. The first one is the marginal effect. And what the marginal effect is looking at is the change in my quantity supplied for a change in the price. And that is just pretty much saying straight, if I get a plus one dollar change in the price, by how much does my quantity supplied increase by? Do I go plus five units? Do I go plus 15 units, right? It's just saying for every dollar change in the price, how many units my quantity supplied changes by. Similar with our demand side, the issue with our marginal effect is that it's just looking at the magnitude and it's no kind of insight as to, well, what was our initial production? Is this a large change or is this a small change? Same thing with the change in price. Is a change of a dollar in price massive or is the change of a dollar in price small? If you're talking about five cent gummies, change in price of a dollar is insane. If you're talking about real estate, change in the price of real estate by a dollar is nothing. So marginal effect, it's interesting, it gives us some insight, but it's limited. Again, keep in mind, if we were to take a look at our supply curve, so we have our axes, we have our price, we have our quantity, we have our supply, Right, we can calculate the slope of this supply curve, rise over run, and this slope is the change in price over the change in quantity. Marginal effect, change in quantity over change in price. So that is when we have our inverse supply, this willingness to accept, or this marginal cost expression of price equals M. Q plus B, right? So to give it some form, M, our price equals, say, 2Q plus 10, right? That's the guy we were looking at earlier. If we're using this kind of form, this 2, that's my slope, right? That is my change in price over change in Q. But this slope is not my marginal effect. If I were to rewrite this, if I were to express it the other way as an actual supply, that is quantity as MP plus B, right? Rewrite it the other way. Well, I would get my actual marginal effect there. So if we wanted to quickly rework through that, all we do is just resolve this. So price, e uh, sorry, price minus 10 equals 2Q. Divide everything by 2. And we would get, uh, man, math's not going well right now. Price equals 0 0.5 price minus 5 equals Q, right? This guy here, this is now my marginal effect. We have taken the inverse of this. This is now going to be my change in quantity for a change in price. So again, just like with our demand curve, we can obtain the marginal effect just by taking one over our slope of this marginal cost or willingness to accept line of price equals 2Q plus 10. Right, one over two. That was hardly a two. There we go. One over two gave us 0.5. So marginal effect can always get pulled from our equation here. Okay. Given that, given our limited kind of use of our marginal effect, what our big interest really is for measuring sensitivity is the elasticity of supply. Just like the elasticity of demand, what we're gonna be looking at is, hey, what is my percent change in my quantity supplied for a percent 
change in the price. And again, same kind of interpretation. We're just kind of trying to find out, do I have a larger percent change here versus here? If this guy is bigger, if I get a bigger percent change in quantity, well, then I'm elastic. I'm sensitive to price changes. If I get a bigger price change, but a small quantity change, well, then I'm not very sensitive. I'm inelastic. So same kind of interpretations as with our demand curve. We don't need to have the absolute value sign anymore because, of course, law of supply. If I have a positive change in price, I'm going to have a positive change in quantity supply, meaning this guy will always work out to be a positive result. So I don't need to worry about taking absolute values. In the same way, we can always go through just like we did with our elasticity of demand, and we can work through all that algebra to re-express uh, this as just the change in our quantity supplied all over the change in price times the average price all over the average quantity supplied. Right, in this case here, this guy, the reason why this is useful is this guy's our marginal effect, which can be pulled out of our formula if we know the expression of the line, which sometimes makes things easier. Again, why do we have average price, average quantity supplied? That's because given the uncertainty of direction, when we find, say, the percent change in quantity supplied, that would be quantity supplied one minus quantity supplied zero all over the average quantity supplied. And again, the reason behind that, as we saw with our demand curve, say we had two points. Say we had two points here. And let's suppose that these were, um, oh, let's, yeah, let's give them values. Let's say 10 and 15. Given that we know our equation here, we can work out the price. So 2 times 10 is 20 plus 10 is 30. And then for 15, 2 times 15 is 30, plus 10 is 40. Okay, so I have these two points. Let's suppose that I am interested in determining what my elasticity of supply is between these two points. Well, okay, keep in mind, at no point have I said, hey, price used to be 30 and it went up to 40. At the same time, I did not say price was 40 and it dropped down to 30. All I was saying is that I'm interested in what is my price sensitivity in this region. So because I don't have direction, any implied or explicit direction, I need to use this average value in order to figure out what my elasticity is. So, hey, we have the values. Let's work through this, see what our elasticity is between these two points. We can work through this and get the exact same answer whether we use this form or this form. So let's work through both just to kind of show that. So starting off, let's use this form here, such that the elasticity of supply is the percent change in my quantity supplied all over the percent change in price. So to start off, what's my percent change in quantity supplied? Percent change Q. Well, let's go 15 minus 10. All over the average, so what's the average? Add the two together, divide by two, so 25 divided by two. 25 divided by two, that yields us 12.5. Okay, so that gives us a percent change, five over 12.5. We get a 40% change in our quantity. So 0 0.40. What about change in price? Okay, percent change in price. This guy, we have 40 to 30. So 40 minus 30 all over our average. 40 plus 30 is 70. 70 divided by 2 is 35. So we have 10 over 35, which gives us a 28%. Oh, no, let's round properly. 0.2857, so a 29% change in price. Working through our elasticity then, 40% change in quantity, 29% change in price, 
right? This year, this is why this expression of elasticity is nice. We can kind of see what's happening. This guy is a relatively big change in quantity supplied. Relatively speaking, this is a smaller change in price. Bigger change up here means that I'm actually sensitive to the change in price. So that is, I can work out this will be greater than one, meaning that it's going to be an elastic supply. But let's actually calculate that. Rather than just saying, hey, it's greater than one, what is it? So 0.4 divided by 0.29, uh, that's going to give me 1.38. 1.38. So again, yes, I'm greater than one. Same kind of interpretation as with our elasticity of demand. This means that I'm sensitive to a change in price. It means that I'm elastic. Again, to interpret that, it means that for every 1% change in price, I'm going to witness a 1.38% change in my quantity supplied. So bigger change in my quantity supplied than my price. Okay. Again, with elasticity, I would recommend you kind of just think about, oh, I said we'd work through it with the other formula too. Let me back up. Let me go work through it in the other formula. So let's use this guy. So in this case here, we're looking at the marginal effect times the average price over the average quantity. So marginal effect, we can get this out of our functional form over here. Uh, there is the inverse marginal effect. So we said, hey, one over that slope gave us our marginal effect. So that was 0 0.5. We then need to times it by the average price. We worked that out. Average between 40 and 30 was 35, right? That's just the average. D bar equals 35. And then we worked out average between 10 and 15. Q bar to be 12.5. So working that out, 35 divided by 12.5 times 0.5, and we get uh, 1.40. So a little bit of rounding going on there, but we get our same result. So same elasticity going on in both cases there. Okay. Like I said before, as I was getting to before I forgot, hey, we were also going to go through this method of calculation. What we can also take a look at is just kind of our table as to the potential values of elasticity of supply and how we can interpret them. So again, zero to one is going to be inelastic. And elasticity of supply equal to one is unit elastic. And an elasticity of supply greater than one is elastic, right? Keep in mind, elastic is saying that we are sensitive to the price. Inelastic is saying we are not very sensitive. That's what we are getting at with this terminology of elastic or inelastic. We then have our extremes as well, right? We would have over here an elasticity of supply equal to zero, such that we are perfectly inelastic. That is, we have no price sensitivity whatsoever. And we'd have the other extreme over here, elasticity of supply equal to infinity, such that we are perfectly elastic. And again, if we wanted to kind of take a look at what these extremes look like, perfectly elastic, well, we would have our price, we would have our quantity, sorry, I said perfectly inelastic, so we're not at all sensitive to the price. Our supply curve would look something like that, just a straight line. Perfectly inelastic, no matter what the price does, I keep producing the exact same amount. So, perfectly inelastic. The other extreme then, perfectly elastic supply. Well, we would have our price, we would have our quantity, and a perfectly elastic it is super sensitive. Oh, that's the wrong tool. Let's try that with a line. Super sensitive to changes in price. So we have a horizontal line such that any increase in price, quantity would shoot out to infinity. 
any decrease in price, quantity would drop down to zero. We are extremely sensitive to our changes in price in this case here. So our two extremes. Yes, this is our table of our elasticities. Yes, many of you will just say, okay, great, I'm gonna memorize this table and interpret elasticities this way. Yes, you can do that. It will be far more beneficial for you to actually spend the time, if it's not clear, to actually interpret what elasticity is telling us and witness, hey, if I have this bigger change in the numerator, that's big change in quantity supplied for a tiny change in price, I get a value bigger than one, meaning that I'm sensitive, right? How do I know that I'm sensitive? Because this guy changed more than that guy changed. If this guy changed less than this guy changed, well, then I'm not very sensitive. I'm inelastic. And that's going to be the much better way, much more kind of concrete way for you to kind of work through elasticity and be able to interpret it and not make mistakes, especially as you start to compare elasticity of supply and then there's the income, right? All the other elasticities that exist as well. Now, in that case there, we're not taking a look at any other elasticities for our supply curve. Yes, we could look at our cross price elasticity. We could take a look at really how strong of complements or substitutes different goods are. But at Econ 103, all we're going to be taking a look at is just this elasticity of supply. So just that basic one. In that sense there, we've completed this video on supply. We have taken a look at our supply curve, kind of the different interpretations of it. We have calculated areas underneath the supply curve to get value. We have then moved on to this idea of determinants of supply, how it dances around as different things change, and then wrapped up with our measurements of sensitivity. So that does us for supply. In the next video, next series of videos rather, we're going to bring these two concepts together, supply and demand. We'll create our market and we'll figure out the determination of price and quantity exchanged. Uh, we'll also be taking a look at equilibriums and disequilibriums, surplus and total benefit or total surplus really is what we're gonna be getting up there. That is what society gets from the good being produced. Our gains from trade, if we wanted to really wrap this all back around. So that does us for here. If you have any questions on supply or demand, feel free to reach out to me either by email or posting to our discussion board.